There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent, be still, and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell Podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio, like always, with an amazing man by the name of Mahor Miklos, I think I pronounced it somewhat correctly. He is a amazing Hungarian healer slash medical professional that uh, is actually in my private membership group and is incredibly well trained, probably as well trained as anybody I know on the planet because all of his mentors are my friends, which is obviously uh, Dr. Neil Rougier, Dr. Keith Nichols, Dr. Rob Kominarik. Uh, and others uh, to be leaving off. But uh, Mikolos, it's such an honor to have you here today, brother. How are you, man? I'm doing awesome. Thank you. Awesome, man. Um, so let me give you guys his background. He has a doctorate of science in biology and a doctorate of nursing practice. He's also the director of clinical education at Viking Alternative Medicine. And honestly, we're just going to have a conversation today about hormones, um, where the world, where it's going, um, why it's still so broken. Uh, as him and I were just talking off air and him and I have had many conversations in our private membership group, bro, it's not getting better. You would think that with the information and the science and the evidence-based practice of so many, you know, awesome leading doctors, especially as it relates to the hormonal optimization space, that we would be getting smarter and not dumber, but it's not the case. And I know you know that. Why is that, bro? Uh, you mean with respect to bioidentical hormone optimization? Yeah. Yeah. I just think it's um, uh, it's, it's just woeful ignorance, uh, you know, uh, on the part of um, uh, you know the Western medically trained mind. Um, uh, you know, uh, as I tell patients uh, many times, in my private practice as well as um, uh, with the Viking practice, uh, you know, um, um, in uh, in conventional medicine, we're you know we're trained to use you know hormones to treat pathology and disease. Yeah. Uh, uh, the average Western trained physician uh, uh, doesn't understand the difference between the optimization and the treatment of pathology. Right. Uh, right. And so um, if uh, um, a person comes into their office uh, anywhere in the United States and their total testosterone is not less than 300 on two separate occasions with commonly occurring symptoms of hypogonadism, they could jump up and down, stand on their head, scream and yell, they're not going to get for testosterone. Um, they may get a prescription for a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, get a pat on the back and say, hey, bud, this is what happens when you get older. Your belly's going to grow. You're going to decrease in your libido. You're going to have erectile dysfunction, but it's okay. Listen, if you want somebody to talk to, I'll send you down the street to the psychiatrist. He can make you feel better about what's going on. But this, is, this is just the fact of life, and there's nothing that you can do about it. Well, that's just foolishness. That's a bunch yeah. of sense. Um, and it's tragic. Now, there are many people walking around on planet Earth today that are on testosterone that have no business being on testosterone. But there are equal amounts and even more that are being robbed of the benefits of hormone optimization because uh, the physicians caring for them just uh, um, are completely ignorant um, of uh, how to you know, um, manipulate these hormones to radically change uh, the quality of life of the person. Yeah, man. Uh <laughs> It's hard to follow up. There's some good stuff in there. Um, dude, it's insane. I mean, I just, it's weird because, you know, obviously we have our show, which I know you watch on sat on Wednesday nights, uh, the health optimization round table with the real true leaders and visionary doctors in this field. I mean, Dr. Rob has been prescribing hormones for 22 years. You know, Keith is like 13 or 14. Rudy's like 11. Uh, and obviously I've been on therapeutic testosterone myself now for going on 22 years. So, I mean, between us, I mean, the, the collective experience level is just insane, but it's, it gets weird because it's the same shit over and over again. Like no matter what we say, it's like he says, they have a belief perseverance in disinformation. 
no matter how you show them from an evidence-based scientific awareness level, and you know, obviously we could just use the because we would get it there anyway, but just the whole understanding of the misunderstanding of, of, of estrogen or estradiol and why, you know, aromatase does its job and why it's so important. And it's, it's so incredible that no matter what you say to people, they still come at you with the same, again, call it misinformation, disinformation, bro science, whatever you want to call it from 20 years ago that, you know, the, the, the medical prescribing community, as well as the bro world thought that it was important to keep testosterone high and estrogen low. And so no matter what we say, no matter what we show, no matter what we talk about, especially when it comes to estrogen, because, you know, the number one question that people still come with who are somewhat educated, they'll say, because they say high estrogen and then you, you know, you back them off that ledge and you say, there's no such thing. And then they say, yeah, but I'm estrogen dominant. And then you say, no, there's no such thing. And then they say, they understand that, that you get them to the, or they get to the place of, okay, but what is the right level of estrogen? Because my doc says that 65 is too high. My doc says 49 is too high, whatever, 70. And it's like, you know, Keith has trained me really well to say this and say, well, we, what we do know is that the minimum protective effect, according to the evidence, is 70, right? To be vascularly protected, to have a level of 70 estrogen. But Mikolos, as you know, like all these men, especially men, and, and, and this obviously extends into the women's realm too, but all these men think that high estrogen is a thing and they're looking for levels because obviously the standard mean deviation of lab corp and quest and all these other various governing bodies that measure lab measurements try to keep people compressed into this range of whatever the fuck it is i think it's like 21 to 44 or 18 to 37 whatever it is i know it's moving all the time but what is the answer to men in your professional opinion when they ask what should the level be as a cutoff, because I know it's a tough question to answer and, and we know that there's no such thing as high estrogen. And we know that the real answer is your, your estrogen should never be blocked and it should fall where it falls. But what do you tell somebody when they come at you and there's that un, uninformed and, and again, been misled for 20 years? So um, I, um, I begin that conversation with patients by explaining the riddle of estrogen metabolism and explaining the two polarized different views on, uh, on estrogen metabolism with respect to bioidentical hormone optimization. Yeah. Um, you know, the former, uh, the, the, the first view is um, uh, the view that you just mentioned. Um, these, uh, you know, providers or this uh, view that holds that um, it's absolutely necessary that you use an aromatase and get there in as many forms to, um, to, uh, to substantially suppress estrogen. Um, and why is that? And that's because they are petrified of estrogen. Um, uh, you know, um, all of the major, uh, you know, uh, uh, cancers that, that we worry about in males, colorectal breast, uh, um, hepatocarcinoma, um, uh, prostate neoplasia, you know, um, have proposed the estrogen driven components to them. But we know that every randomized controlled trial that has ever looked at estrogen has demonstrated just the opposite. Uh, that estrogen does not cause cancer, it does just the opposite. Right. And the estradiol is apoptotic to cancer cells. It kills cancer cells. It's antineogenic to existing cancer cell lines by mitigating the ability of uh, cancer cells to proliferate. It's critically important to robust sexual function, to erectile function, penile sensitivity, ejaculatory volume, testicular volume. It's critically important to normal lipid metabolism yeah. and, and glucose handling. Um, as well as protecting the male from numerous types of cancers. Yep. Um, it's cardioprotective, neuroprotective, it protects the prostate. So over-suppressing estrogen in a male over time substantially increases his risk for strokes and heart attacks and developing numerous uh, and neoplastic diseases and wrecking his lipid metabolism, et cetera. So it is a profound mistake on the part of a provider to over-suppress uh, estrogen. Um, largely, uh, you know, men in when S when testosterone is replaced properly in a medically replaced dose, this idea of uh, estrogen dominance that men are afraid of, they just buy into this de novo effect that they, that, the, you know, their nipples are a little sensitive every once in a while. And oh my God, they got the, you know, they got tons of testosterone or their estrogen on board and something bad's going to happen to them. Yeah. Foolishness. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, these symptoms largely, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, disappear on their own. And if they have gynecomastia prior to starting testosterone, and many, many of these men do um, because of abuse of PEDs, um, you know, or other comorbid illnesses, you know, the, um, the fix is surgery. It's not throwing exactly. 
aromatase inhibitors uh, at them. And by the way, um, uh, the aromatase inhibitor doesn't affect the estrogen uh, um, receptor at the breast tissue. It's not an AI that's going to fix that nonsense. That's right. That's right. So, that's right. Um, so, you know, it's um, it's just, uh, you know, bad, bad information, uh, you know, that, that men are reading on the Internet that, um, uh, you know, that that creates this, uh, you know, this false sense of fear. Um, so there's a lot of men that come, for instance, to Viking from other practices, um, you know, where um, they have all kinds of shit thrown at them for, you know, excuse the vernacular, you know, they're they're placed on aromatase inhibitors, Arimidex, one milligram every other day for crying out loud. Uh, and, um, you know, they come to Viking or they come to this practice or to my office and they say, you know, something's wrong. I feel bad. I don't know what's going on. I just feel bad. Um, and, uh, you know, when you stop the aromatase inhibitor, all of a sudden their symptoms go away. Um, and, uh, so, um, you know, I tell the patients that, uh, you know, we're going to remove, you know, this substance, this over-suppressing, uh, one of the most, uh, important hormones that, uh, you know, exists in the male, and that's estrogen. One of the reasons why testosterone is so protective to the body is because part of it aromatizes to estrogen. Right. So right. And understand that, um, you know, it allays, uh, it allays their fears and concerns. I hope that answers that. Yeah, that's a great answer. I mean, look, no matter what we say, and again, it just, it's like beating a dead horse, but the, the benefits of testosterone at the tissues is like Keith likes to say, or tr- totally from estradiol, obviously being converted, right? I mean, estrogen is what confers protection. You know, all these people, and again, there's so many physicians that are brain dead over this too, that, you know, they talk about this estrogen dominance. And as you know, you know, Neil, did his profound, I think, lecture and started it in 2017. And it really started making the rounds in 2018 and 2019. But he was like, there's no such thing as estrogen dominance. There's high inflammation due to too much visceral body fat. And, you know, when you really truly understand how insane uh, visceral body fat is from an inflammatory understanding, right? It's more inflammatory than kerosene. You really start getting really... It's a very interesting thing from a metaphysical standpoint because you're like, why would the human body be putting on a highly inflammatory substance around it from not living a clean lifestyle or, you know, engaging in excess sugar, alcohol, carbohydrates, you know, again, not living insulin controlled. It's crazy to think about that. But I'm telling you, dude, like I have this conversation probably five times a week and, and it's with usually physicians. It's usually medically trained professional people who consistently use that terminology. He's estrogen dominant or she's estrogen dominant. And it's like, well, that's actually a good thing. <laughs> right? like, like you can't, you can't untrain them. It's like Keith says again, the belief perseverance, but what do you say to people, especially doctors? Because I mean, again, dude, this is probably 60 to 70% of the medical field that uses this terminology. How do you get them off of that? It's very difficult. <laughs> And very difficult, almost impossible. It's so funny when I first when I first entered the training program with Dr. Neil Rousier, um, you know, um, uh, the first module he, he gave this lecture to us all, um, you know, telling us uh, that it's going to take him X amount of time to break our confirmation bias. We've been trained in graduate school and in medical school how to look at estrogen and testosterone, and uh, um, everything that we've been taught is wrong. Exactly, dude. Exactly. So you know, until we um, we were faced with uh, the countless numbers of medical studies um, that uh, Dr. Brusier presented, that was the only thing that broke me out of um, you know uh, you know the lie that I was believing regarding that whole optimization. Um, And um, uh, one of the things that draws that drew clinicians like me and physicians and providers all over the country and around the world to Dr. Rousier is that everything he teaches is evidence-based. Every time he teaches a book, yeah. it's, uh, you know, um, there is a research paper that, uh, you know, um, discusses, uh, you know, the point that he's illustrating. And so um, this is not just some man pontificating, uh, you know, his thoughts. Uh, this is all based in science, all evidence-based. Uh, and um, after looking at the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles uh, that he showed to us throughout the, the entire training program, um, I had no choice but to change the way I believed. Right. Uh, you know, and it radically changed the way I uh, I approached hormone therapy. I'm so grateful to him. Yeah, and all of us. And, and, you know, it's interesting because, you know, going back in the old days, and I was there at these conferences, you know, these doctors would come up and they would debate him. 
And, you know, as you know, he's so gifted. He just lets her and he just shakes his head and goes, okay, fine. That's what you want to believe next. <laughs> it's, not funny. You know, we were, uh, we, uh, um, uh, it, it's amazing in the, uh, in the, in the, um, in, in the training program, there was, uh, there were, you know, uh, guys that, that we would just laugh among ourselves because every time somebody would stand up and ask a question, a physician would ask a stupid question, um, or, uh, challenge Dr. Ruzi in some way, he would just look at them and there'd be a pregnant pause and he'd say, yeah, you do whatever you want. <laughs> and so that was an automatic declaration to the audience that that was a dumbass that just answered that question. <laughs> I've never seen a guy put people down in the most nondescript way. And then, you know, these people, as you know, as crazy as they are, let's just be honest, because, you know, they got to get the the last word in. They would stand up there and fling their hands and run their hands through their hair and be like, but Dr. Rougier, are you not going to agree with me? And he'd just be like, next. <laughs> he would be looking at the guy behind him or the woman behind him. Dude, I will never forget those days. He, you know, he did it with the great Don, Dr. John Chrysler. May he rest in peace with the whole little bit. But, but, but Neil, they need a little bit of an AI. I mean, I love John and, you know, we go way back and stuff. But I mean, I saw that so many times. He, he's so gifted. Uh, in doing that, you know, that I was the only person that he ever actually allowed, a, did, a granted the access to do a podcast with. There's been so many people that have come after me that have wanted to do a podcast with him. And he's like, look, I'm not going to do it. It's not what I do. If you want to listen to me speak what I speak about, come to these, uh, you know, come to the uh, seminars, you know, and come to my lectures and stuff like that. You know, come to, you know, his thing in, in Utah. Um, I mean, look. Neil is uh, the, the the true stalwart. I mean, he's the bastion. I mean, he is the father of hormonal. I mean, you know, obviously people will talk about Morgan Taylor, but really Neil is the guy because Morgan Taylor is more from the science aspect. And obviously, thank God for him that he proved all the bullshit wrong, especially when it comes to the prostate, the heart. But um, Neil's the guy that was actually in the trenches, you know, teaching. And as you know, the reason he stopped is because CBS did a hit piece on him and they you know, took all of his lectures and took all of his words and literally edited it into some sort of bullshit. I mean, you, I know you saw that when it was like three or four years ago when they went after him. And since then he's just, you know, not in the public eye. So I'm actually grateful because he did those podcasts with me in 2018. Wow. You know what I mean? So it's like, it, it, it was a gift. I mean, there are three of them and they're all, so, they're still three of the best podcasts. I mean, they're the best podcasts ever done on estrogen metabolism by far, but no one listens to them because again, there's just so much disinformation. Yeah. You know what I mean? When I was looking at, um, uh, you know, um, programs to go to years ago, and uh, when I really wanted to understand hormone placement therapy, I talked to fellows from the American Academy for Anti-Aging Medicine, guys who graduated from, you know, um, uh, functional medicine programs that were a little fortune to go to. And um, uh, and these were guys that were in Neil's uh, class, that were my class with Neil. And I would ask them, why you spent a fortune on this training, on these top level training programs? And they would tell me over and over again, well, you know, we went through these programs and we couldn't get these people better. And, uh, you know, it just we couldn't get them better until we went to Neil. We learned from Neil and now, now these patients are getting better. We're fixing them. So that's why we're here, you know. <laughs> so. And it's it's mind blowing. But then, I mean, look, I'll, you know, I'll, we'll, we'll stay there. We'll keep it there because it was always fascinating to me. Neil would give this profound lecture. And the very next person, you know, I'm thinking of AMMG, would come up and literally just dis completely not discredit him, but basically take an opposite viewpoint. And, you know, and speak about, you know, I won't mention this guy's name, but this guy's name is actually well known in the hormone optimization space. And, you know, he was talking about how to use an AI for hormonal optimization for aging men. Because as you know, the clinical research shows that an AI does increase uh, total and free testosterone. And so, you know, well, we can do this and we don't have to inject with a needle of testosterone. I mean, you know, dude, the insanity of all of this. And then in the same lecture, I mean, I literally listened to this guy for 20 minutes and I'm sitting right next to Dr. Rob and he's not listening because he's texting. <laughs> I, I'm like looking at him and I'm like, dude, like you're on the board of AMMG, like why is this allowed to happen? But again, dude, it's medicine. You know, they're not going to, they're not going to silence dissenting opinions, right. but in the, tr but the truth is, or the, or the truth should lead. The truth should not be suppressed. You should not have somebody coming up and talking about his opinion because of the way he interprets the data. But again, dude, that's the problem with studies. 
You can, like Keith always says, you can find 25 observational studies, not randomized controlled, placebo controlled studies, but 25 observational studies that will conclude exactly the bullshit that you think. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how uh, non-RCT trials uh, can be manipulated, uh, you know, through observation and the data uh, can be manipulated in favor of those trying to pass an agenda. It's, it's disgusting. It's absolutely totally insane and you know thank god for the great dr anthony j and his novel book estrogen generation you know he literally wrote you know and this guy was the mayo clinic's leading researcher on estrogen metabolism and he literally wrote that he it pains me to say this but all peer review and published science research is pay for play all of it there's not one of it isn't right so it's like when you know that you can't and, and look these young kids don't know this you know that but like you know, because they'll, they'll be like, but Miklos, but Jay, you got to study for that. I need 10, bro. It's like, uh, dude, not one study matters anything because they're all literally bribes. These people basically start off with their pre pre you know preconceived outcome and then they reach out to their buddies, you know, in the science uh, places and they say, hey, look, I'm going to create this study and I'm going to need you to echo it and I'm going to pay you X. And they're like, Oh yeah, sure. No problem. I mean, half of these people don't even read the fucking study. They just rubber stamp it. But yeah, dude, I mean, peer review and published research is literally at this point a scam. And as you know, the, the, the publisher of Lancet, who's no longer there came out in a public dissertation two years ago and said that you can't trust any published, any peer review anymore. It's all pay for play. All of it. Every single one. You can't trust. And dude, you know this. And you learned this from Neil. You know, we all did. I mean, we're all biochemically unique, bro. Every single one of us is out of one. So what goes on for somebody is not going to go on for you. You know, you may get better benefit at 225 milligrams a week of testosterone than me, and I may get better benefit at 125. So it doesn't matter what so-and-so shows in a study when we're all biochemically unique. It's ridiculous. Yes, but why do people not understand that? Like, why are they still out there, tr tr you know, tr tr trumpeting the studies and the science? Is it just where we've gone as a culture because of wokeism? Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, a lot of that is absolutely true. And I think that, um, um, you know, when um, one generation is brainwashed with a particular right. all set of ideas, that tends to be perpetuated and so unless somebody breaks the cycle. Um, I think you're right. Um, uh, Dr. Roussier, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, frequently referred to those uh, kind of clinicians as uh, the ones that, uh, you know, are like ostriches that put their head in the sand and they refuse, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to listen. Um, you know, uh, they get taught one way um, in residency by, um, uh, you know, by a group of physicians that are taught by their mentors who are taught by their mentors. Uh, a certain way and then um, you know and they refuse to uh you know listen to um you know to reason um and it's uh, it's unfortunate because it then perpetuates a generation or generations of clinician who uh are operating uh you know under uh you know false information and um it's uh, it's tragic let's let's talk about rand mclean um i've never done this publicly in a, in, in a podcast i mean obviously i did out him recently in an email because he came after me on instagram which is literally insane i mean look rand is a really nice man i mean i know people who work for him i have rescued literally hundreds of his patients uh obviously i've sent them to other doctors more accomplished who understood the estrogen metabolism better but um he is a good person i will say that he has he's he's a, a good business person he has a good bedside manner with his patients other than being completely wrong about this estrogen stuff why is someone like him, and I know this is an opinion question for you, but why is someone like him not able to change when all of the evidence proves he's wrong? Yeah, I, you know, that's, that's a difficult question, uh, Jay. I just think that, um, you know, Dr. McLean has, um, you know, uh, grabbed on to a particular set of beliefs with respect to, um, you know, hormone optimization and, yeah. um, um, he just, um, he just won't listen uh, or really uh, entertain, uh, you know, um, opposing uh, opposing viewpoints. Um, and yeah. uh, I, I don't I don't know why um, that, um, yeah. that that's the case. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean it's sad. I mean I, I know it's an a, 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 an opinion question anyway. You know, but it's it's 
he has so many patients of, you know, repute. I mean, you know, he has a lot of celebrity customers, a lot of celebrity clients. I mean, obviously he practices in Southern California and he has a very big name, but it's, it's a shame because, um, I mean, these guys, I mean, again, you know, this is not opinion, you know, the, a lot of these men are being placed into harm. I mean, you and I both know what happens when you keep a man's estrogen in the single digits year round. I mean, only bad things happen, bro. Right. <laughs> Yes, sir. It's not good. Um, all right, let's move on to uh, to body fat modulation or weight loss. I mean, obviously right now, uh, and for people watching this, today is September 14th. I just released my newest book, which is 30 Days to Shreds last week, which sounds like a bro book, but it's not. It's a scientific uh, dissertation on how to use the latest and greatest peptides to dramatically reduce body fat, you know, within the health, within the context of health and longevity in the shortest time possible. And that's why we say 30 days. What are your, you know, and I know you, you know, use peptides pretty strongly in your practice, but like, what are your thoughts now on where we are with peptides as, as, as they relate to GLP one agonists and where we're going? Uh, I think that um, uh, the data on GLP one agonists, uh, you know, is still evolving. Uh, you know, um, since uh, uh, their indications uh, have been expanded, um, you know, uh, to uh, to weight loss, um, uh, it's interesting that there's still many in the conventional medical community who uh, look at you when you talk about GLP agonists for weight loss like you're crazy. It just uh, it just uh, um, it mystifies me. <laughs> so um, you know, um, and when you when you ask them about this, they say, well, you know, that's just that's just a side effect. The patient loses. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, I spend the majority of my time practicing in a very busy academic, uh, you know, medicine practice. And yes. uh, I have these discussions uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, my colleagues in the teaching hospital all the time. So, <laughs> so they, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's funny that way. But, um, you know, uh, the benefits um, the, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, the GOP-1 receptor agonists, um, you know, are being uncovered um, every day. Not only uh, in, um, in you know appetite suppression, but it's uh, it's cardiovascular protection, um, and uh, you know other um, other protective benefits uh, you know of these peptides is really you know truly amazing, um, and uh, you know many clinicians now around the country, uh, even when a patient meets their weight loss objectives, they continue these patients on a modified maintenance dose of the GLP-1 for long term. Um, uh, you know, periods because uh, they have so many benefits, uh, you know, to the body. Um, and so, which is, uh, you know, where my practice has, uh, has gone now, I really believe that uh, long-term use of the GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, really provide so many benefits to the patient uh, that um, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, it's silly to stop it prematurely, you know, when they, when they immediately, you know, uh, reach their weight loss objectives. I, I continue them on the medicine, particularly if they have comorbid illnesses, um, you know, uh, they, they just benefit so much you know, from this medicine. Well, look, let's go deeper on this. Cause I've been using these for two years and, you know, there's obviously a lot of also misinterpretation of the research as always. And yes, there are people that are going to say the jury is still out. Like you intelligently said at the beginning, because they are early, but as a, as a long-term biohacker, hormone optimization, optimization person uh, who's used peptides for a long time, I mean, I know when I'm like, you know, walking a path that is risky and I'm telling you, bro, like I don't sense any of that. The problem with these agents, and I know you know this, but it's interesting. It, I mean, it's important for us to stress this with the audience, the majority, and again, we're not bad mouthing the medical profession because they're just doing their job. As like I said, they have the same mortgage payments and school college tuition payments and, you know, car payments, insurance payments as everybody else. But the majority of them prescribing GLP ones do not understand at the level that people like you and I do how to also teach our patients, our clients, how to lose fat slash weight effectively. They're just prescribing these agents and then saying, Go about your merry way. And as you know, they're so clinically effective in suppressing appetite that, bro, the majority of these, and let's be honest, the majority of people they prescribe them to are obese and insulin resistant, metabolically deranged. They go off and they use them and they know how to inject it once a week. And dude, they stop eating, right? Like they literally have no desire to eat. And so if you're a great big fat person, 250 pound woman, 300 pound plus man, and you're on this, 
And all of a sudden you stop eating your six garbage meals a day and you're eating two garbage meals a day and the weight is falling off you. Of course, you're not going to care about eating enough protein or going to the gym and lifting and doing all the things that you and I know that has to be concomitant with all these, with, with the usage of these things. And so in that way, I, you know, understand why these doctors get upset when they say, well, look, they got weight loss. But as you and I both know, like there's a proper way to lose body fat. And there's also a way to basically destroy your metabolism. And so many people have been using these things in the way to destroy the metabolism, which as you know, is not eating enough protein, not doing resistance training, not sleeping well, not minimizing your carbohydrate intake. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but that's the problem. If this was actually being administered in a way that you and I know how to do, there wouldn't be any of these problems, my brother, none. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And the, the tragedy is, is that um, uh, many clinicians who are putting uh, patients on the GLP-1 uh, um, agonist uh, for the purpose of weight loss are not educating them on, no. um, on the things that you just mentioned. And so these patients effectively sabotage um, the utilization of this amazing pharmacologic tool. So I tell patients all the time, if you're going to live at McDonald's and Burger King and not sleep and uh, poison your body by putting garbage in it and not exercise, um, you might as well flush that medicine down the toilet. Um, uh, this is simply a pharmacologic tool to help you enter a caloric deficit safely and then radically change the way you live and eat and exercise and sleep. That is what's going to radically change your body. Um, uh, the needle alone is not going to obtain that objective. And so um, that missing piece is, um, is, uh, is, is a big problem in many practices. I mean, exactly, man. It exactly. I mean, I mean, I mean, I, you know, again, without mentioning names, the people that are out there that should know better talking shit about GOP one agonists, it's insane. And, and look, you know, I've had people come up to me on social media, uh, in the bodybuilding community and say, you know, we know you're a smart guy and you know, peptides and all this stuff and it's cool, but like, you know, you need to stay in your lane when it comes to like GLP one agonist with the pro bodybuilding community and you know, those guys and stuff. And I laugh in their face because I'm like, I already know pro bodybuilders that are using semaglutide and terzapatide with profound results during their, you know, during their times of peak getting into peak condition. So all these people out there say that they're not tools that can be used by pretty much anybody from any application, you know, whether it's performance enhancement, bodybuilding, uh, you know, just, normal everyday Joe and Jane, you know, who want to lose body fat and, and, and obviously maintain muscle. I mean, it's not true. And so, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm blown away because obviously, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline. Uh, I've been using Redditrutide for two months and honestly, I don't think it's as good as Terzapatide. That's my personal opinion. It is a triple agonist versus a double agonist, but the magical combination is Terzapatide for the appetite suppression and Redditrutide with it for the metabolic uncoupling. And that's what I found obviously in my own self experimentation, because what happens with red true tide, and by the way, this is the first podcast I've talked about this is it increases sweating, right? Because it literally is increasing resting metabolism and increasing re uh, thermogenesis and obviously respiratory rate. Uh, it doesn't speed up the heart. I have not felt that I've never not, not once noticed that, but bro, I mean, again, and this is just logical, uh, by increasing metabolism so much, it has a very unfortunate side effect of increasing <laughs> hunger because you're blowing through your calories, right? So it's like Welter's appetite is the answer because we know it suppresses appetite. So if you could combine both of these, and obviously the pharmaceutical industry, I'm sure, is way ahead and already thinking about doing that, you've got the magic, uh, you know, uh, agent you know, whatever you want to call it. And, and look, I've had guys, I've talked to, you know, very high level bodybuilders slash influencer guys now in the community who've asked me, they're like, dude, just break it down to us. Is it like DNP? <laughs> and I'll be like, I've never taken DNP, so I don't have any firsthand experience, but I will say this from the people, which obviously I know many people that have used it, um, who talk about having a low grade fever and feeling like absolute death, but you know, you're walking around for two or three days at 101 degree temperature, which is obviously increasing th the thermic effect of or, or caloric burn. Um, it does do that a little bit, uh, meaning red true tide. And so I, I really do think that we are close, my brother in, 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 in coming out with some form of a peptide or again, 
you know, call it a GLP-1 agonist or a triple agonist where we, we, we really will be able to completely modify cellular metabolism to a place of like, we can get people to where we need them to be. And obviously, you know, everything is always uh, a grain of salt contingent with living a healthy lifestyle, living a fully optimized lifestyle. But I'm telling you, bro, we're, we're much closer than people think. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of mind blowing, um, you know, what's really out there, but I, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm telling you, like, if you give a person terzapatide and you coach them and I know semaglutide is okay, but it's not as good as terzapatide. But if you coach them how to do this correctly, and you obviously don't, you know, you're not the guy that says, oh, after two weeks, you should increase to five milligrams and then seven and a half milligrams and 10 milligrams. And you just keep them in a moderate dose. And again, with a, again, with proper coaching, dude, you're right. I mean, two and a half milligrams of terzapatide is an amazing tool to change. It's not just, as you know, to losing the body fat, but it changes habits in the brain. It's literally removing, um, you know, impulse issues or lack of impulse control because it's changing brain chemistry in a positive way. There's already science out there showing this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. Uh, I hear from patients all the time. Not only does it affect brain biochemistry, but um, you know, it effectively pharmacologically teaches the body how to properly eat. You know, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, guys and girls will tell me all the time, man, oh man, I used to love certain types of food. Now I know them. Uh, <laughs> so, six uh, Krispy Kremes anymore, bro. <laughs> yeah, sure. And that's what's so amazing about it. It's absolutely true. I mean, I've had literally women, you know, send me these long, deep, profound emails about how it changes their entire life for the exact same thing as you just said. That I literally have no intention of de destroying myself when I get emotional by eating blank and, you know, insert whatever blank crap food is GMO box stuff food. So yeah, dude, I mean, they're really, truly profound. It's really, it really is insane that we have so many people out there going the opposite way, right? Because you see the stomach paralysis lawsuits or, you know, all this other stuff that they put in the mainstream narrative about, you know, these things being bad for people. And look, I mean, I'll, I'll say it. I've said this before in my own videos that I've done, not in a podcast yet, but and you know this, Miklos, if you don't eat enough protein and you don't lift weights and you don't do cardiovascular exercise, yes, these things are so profound that they could shut down your metabolism to the point where you will have muscle loss. And so Atia and other people are out there saying, oh, they cause muscle loss. Well, that's because they're seeing it in real people who don't know what the fuck they're doing right. using these agents. And again, I, as you said already, clearly, you got to blame the physician. Because if the physician is prescribing this to the patient and the patient is not doing what should be done, you know, concomitantly while using these things, it can't fall on the patient. It's got to fall on the provider or slash the prescriber. Right. Yes, sir. That's hundred percent. That's good. Which is interesting to me because why are people... <laughs> Why are people not able to like read? Well, I mean, I guess it's just a normal part of where we are today because of, you know, the social media generation where they're just engineered with like a 30, a, a 10 second, you know, um, how would I call it? Just a, a blurb, a meme. You know what I'm saying? Where they just hear 10 seconds of like, oh, semaglutide caused this woman stomach paralysis and she's now suing her doctor. You know what I mean? It's always, it's always the same little things where people don't dig deeper and don't get the real information. But I mean, I knew right away after using semaglutide for six months, when I started seeing the negative shit, which has already now been a year, um, that that was not true, that, you know, there was only good things that could be had from this. But I mean, again, I mean, I'm a bro, right? Like, I mean, I live in this world of like knowing how to eat right and how to control my insulin and all those kind of things. Whereas the people that with access to these tools don't. And so, you know, really it, 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 it the burden is on us because we're the ones that actually do understand how to do this stuff. And so we have to be the ones like really at the tip of the spear, putting this information out because you cannot let you know, the, the doomsday prophets speak about this because bro, they're just going to destroy it. I mean, we wrote an article about two months ago. Now we interviewed a very, very well-known healthcare executive talking about the pharmaceutical industry as it relates to GLP one agonists. And he very, very clearly point blank told us that they don't care that it's about profits 
And that if it comes down to where they really do have to create the next drug that prevents muscle breakdown or muscle tissue and protein breakdown, that they will. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like how the I mean, big pharma slash the pharmaceutical industry, you know, is self iterating is they just wait for side effects or symptomology to, to arise in the clinic, uh, clinical end user. And then they create drugs from there rather than, again, teach people the proper way to do shit. That's right. Yes, sir. It's fucking crazy, bro. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about peptides? Like any specific peptides that you that you know you prescribe in your practice that you really you know think are profound? I mean, obviously we spent some good time on GLP one, I guess. But anything else, or did you want to talk about anything really other specific? No, sir. Um, you know, um, um, I mean, uh, you know, peptides is uh, is growing in the in the practice. Um, you know, use a, a lot of the GLP one, um, a lot of the uh, uh, growth hormone security dogs. Uh, you know, um, you know, we're using. Um, um, have a lot of patients, um, you know, that, um, you know, that were utilizing a godfish growth hormone therapy um, uh, and, uh, you know, converting them to um, a growth hormone secreted dog and educating them um, that, uh, you know, there is no, um, th there's no replacement for uh, real growth hormone. Uh, for somebody to say that, uh, yeah, you know, um, um, uh, I will get the exact same benefit um, or the exact same results, uh, you know, from the growth hormone security dog as I will with growth hormone. This is this is foolish. It's, it's not true. However, um, if you have an aging male um, and uh, they're, they're, uh, they are undergoing naturally age-appropriate decline in their growth hormone, um, uh, and, um, you know, you put them on a, a growth hormone security dog uh, um, and balance their other hormones, they respond phenomenally well. Um, you know, you know, to it. So um, not everybody has access to real growth hormone. If it's dosed inappropriately, there can be catastrophic consequences. Yes. And, 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 and to that point, because I'm glad you said that when there are, it's in the bodybuilding world and they're using super physiologic levels. And when I mean super physiological levels, bro, we're talking about guys using genotropin pens like over two days combined with insulin. Right. I mean, like this is not what you or prescribing for your patients or what I talk about with my audience. I mean, this is abuse and that is the problem because you're right. I mean, the, the, the problems come from when they people take way too high a level. And as you know, bro, we live in the United States. It's a super size economy. If, if, if a little bit is good, more is better. And we know that's not the truth, especially when it comes to hormones, growth hormone and peptides. It's never been that way, but people just get brainwashed and they listen to people or they read stories about the bro world and the bro world is not our world. You know, those guys are obviously attempting to be mutants and look, I don't have anything against them. That's their bodies, their life. They can do whatever the fuck they want with them, but it's not what you and I are espousing. That's right. Yes, sir. Absolutely. You know, one to two, I, you know, to pick up where you were one to two, I use a pharmaceutical grade growth hormone. You know, early in the morning to a male or female who's in their 40s, 50s, or 60s is literally what I call the nectar of the gods. It yeah. absolutely will profoundly change everything. Your body composition, your sleep, your skin quality, your well-being. I mean, as you know, it does other things. But you're right, man. There's just too much disinformation and misinformation in the in, in the marketplace about how growth hormone shuts down the pituitary and causes gestational diabetes or insulin resistance or all this bullshit. And it's all because of what you just said. Abuse. It's people taking too high of dosages. I mean, I've had guys come to me, bro, they're like using six IUs a day of genotropin. And I'm like, what in the fuck? Just everyday bros, not even bodybuilders. Yeah, you know, who are just trying to lose weight, and you know, of course, they're drinking three glasses of wine a night, and you know, not doing their exercise, not training, thinking it's six, you know, and then they have carpal tunnel, and you know, all the side effects, and it's like, dude, what the fuck, you know, water retention. I mean, it's insane. But you're right, man. Like, I mean, I love growth hormone, and and you're right. If, if you have access to it, you can afford it, dude. It's a it's a it's a total game changer. And it, and, and as I tell people. Peptides are great, you know, IPA, TESA, CJC, but they also create antibody buildup over time. Right. Yeah, that's why you have to cycle those. Whereas with growth hormone, you could just take a really super surgically precise dose Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, whatever, depending on your age and how much your IGF-1 is. And you don't have to ever worry about stopping because right. it continues to work. Exactly. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. But it's crazy how many people won't do it. 
because they're so fearful of it because they've heard so many lies. I mean, bro, I I've been very open and clear about this. I mean, as you know, in the group, I've measured my IGF. I've been using, you know, one to one and a half. I use of, of genotropin now for two and a half years. Uh, my first year I was eight months on four months off. Uh, and now there's no point, you know, I go Monday through Friday and take Saturday, and Sunday off, but I mean, I've measured on and off. I've never even had a variation. And then people will be like, well, that just means it's not real. I'm like, no, dude, you have to understand IGF levels. It's inter inter individual and variable, right? Like you could measure it four times a day and you can have high and low. It just, it's kind of like testosterone. But the reality is, is like you see profound change, profound alteration in, in pretty much all your biomarkers. And it's like, it's that. Whereas with, with peptides, as you know, you can be on testimorelin for six to eight weeks. It stops working. Yeah. Same thing with ipamorelin. Same thing with CJC. I mean, that's why we have to rotate and cycle these things. And I'm not saying anything bad about them. But clearly, if you have access to growth hormone, it's a better solution for someone who's aging. Yes, absolutely. Do you think there's an age? This is a, another opinion question for you. But do you think there's an age where people should not mess with human growth hormone? <clears throat> I don't think I don't think that there is uh, any real data that substantiates uh, that um, um, after you know uh, X number of years you should stop. Uh, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, I um, uh, have plenty of patients in my private practice that are in their seventies and eighties that are on uh, um, you know a half a unit or a unit of growth hormone, and that they are doing profoundly well. Um, uh, they have pristine blood sugar control. Um, you know, they have no organomegaly. Um, they have uh, no other aberrant changes in their biochemistry. Uh, you know, they uh, um, and they're they're in great health. So um, I um, uh, I don't I don't see any evidence of that whatsoever. I, I agree. The only other question around that would be: Is there is there an age where people are too young, or is it just totally dependent on what your IGF one levels are? <clears throat> so. Uh, just as a general rule, just because of the liability of utilizing growth hormone, of course, uh, it's such a, such a, um, you know, um, unfortunately, the, um, you know, the, the medical stigmatized board, uh, <laughs> that any um, any practice, uh, you know, that uh, there is a, um, uh, I have a friend um, who's a, a physician and an attorney who is uh, completely embraces, uh, you know, age management medicine. I was listening to a talk that he did uh, on jurisprudence for medical practices engaging in age management medicine, and he said, you know. No matter where you are in the United States, any practice that traffics in testosterone, let alone growth hormone, but God forbid growth hormone, but testosterone, you are automatically under the eye of Mordor, yes. uh, the medical board. So it's not going to be a matter of if you get investigated or visited. It's just a matter of when. When, yeah. And, and so, um, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, we have to practice defensive medicine, but, uh, you know, with the... Um, uh, with the objective of doing everything we can of providing the absolute best possible care to patients that we can. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, in my practice, um, you know, uh, if I have a, if I have a, a male under the age of 25, and let's say he has low IGF-1, so, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm making sure that uh, I rule out all the possible, you know, reasons of why this is happening. Does he have a true endocrinopathy? Um, so um, I, you know, frequently get consultants involved uh, where we collaboratively manage the patient because something's going on there it should not be, uh, it should not be happening. So um, just, um, you know, um, at those those young ages, I, um, you know, I steer away from utilizing that, you know, growth hormone. I typically do not see, uh, you know, um, you know, growth hormone deficiency in, you know, males in their, uh, you know, their twenties if they're, uh, you know, if they're otherwise, you know, healthy. So now that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Um, you know, if they have secondary issues, uh, you know, that are causing this, but, um, um, you know, in young males, um, you know, in their twenties, I, you know, I generally steer away from that. Uh, um, uh, and again, um, they may absolutely need it. Some patients that may do require this, but, um, uh, I usually refer them at that point, um, you know, uh, uh, as opposed to just, uh, you know, arbitrarily prescribing those hormones to them. Very well spoken, my friend. It's very unfortunate that we live in a world that health is more scrutinized than than sickness and as you know as a prescriber of health optimization tools that's what i'll just call them tools yeah you're under the watchful eye of the dark side man they're like you got to be very cautious like neil says right like you have to govern your practice as if the state medical licensing board has a 
red bullseye over the top of your practice. And at any point in time, they can come in and audit your files. It's absolutely sickening, but this is the world that we live in, bro. And so, I mean, if anything, it just makes you a better physician. It makes you a better prescriber. It makes you a better healer because you know, you have to cover, you have to dot all the I's and cross all the T's my friend. Yes, sir. You know, that's, that's, that's the way it is. I mean, I mean, it's sad that we live in that world because they're not doing that for people that are given the V's, but dude, it's, it's just, I mean, I mean, it is what it is. Let's just say that. Let's just call it a call spade a spade, bro. This has been a profound podcast, man. I'm really, really grateful. So obviously if people want to work with you now, let me ask you, do you, do you also work? I I presume you guys do do telemedicine. Oh yes. It's uh, it's almost exclusively a telemedicine platform. Yes, sir. Okay. Awesome. So you guys and gals, I mean, if you've listened to this amazing podcast, I now have another physician that I can refer people to. Um, and do you work with, uh, females as well, as well as males? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Fucking sure. amazing. So, I mean, obviously, and let me, let me share, let me share your social too up here. So, uh, Viking lives matter is our IG Viking alternative med- medicine, Facebook. Um, you guys, Mikos has been in my fully optimized health group, I think now for what, like six months. And, um, he is a beacon. Uh, he really understands this. You know, I would put him right up there with Keith and Rob and Rudy, uh, which is a huge credit and testament to you. And again, you've been trained by those guys. So of course, you know, you understand this at the level they do. So, I mean, honestly, bro, I'm just grateful that you came on here today. Is there, you know, you can have the last word, anything else you want to say? Oh, no, I, I just uh, hope I get a chance to, uh, I've never had the privilege of, uh, speaking, uh, um, with Dr. Keith. Um, I have not been that uh, received training from him, but, uh, Dr. Rob and, uh, Dr. Rousier, um, uh, um, Dr. Clearfield, and uh, you know others um, have truly changed my life in the way that I practice medicine. Um, um, but, uh, so I'm just so grateful that uh, you know uh, that you entrusted me to be here and share with you. Thank you so much. No, nah, bro, you are you're more than welcome, and I will literally connect you with Keith as soon as this show's over. So, guys and gals, uh, as always, support the amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell Podcast. Uh, if you are looking for a hormone optimization or health optimization physician. This is the guy, vikingalternative.com. You can follow them also on IG. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see everybody very soon.